Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. One of the big threats that I think a lot of us feel coming down the road, but one that we don't oftentimes prepare for is the idea of an economic collapse, a major economic collapse. You know, a lot of us uh, think about things like storms, wildfires, floods, and things like that, and those can have you know local or regional impacts and can be really severe for the people that are living through them. But in terms of something that has the potential of creating a, a true national emergency or even international emergency, Economic collapse is probably second only to aliens invading by air dropping bird flu infected clown zombies. It's definitely up there uh, both on the danger list and on the likelihood list. I think a lot of us are living now with this sense of kind of existential angst that we can kind of feel that there's something wrong with what's going on, but it's, it's difficult for a lot of us to address it because it's a topic that's really difficult um, in terms of like, you know, there's mathematics involved. I, I don't know if you've ever seen The Wealth of Nations, but the book is like a million feet thick and it's, it's rather opaque. So I've been fortunate enough uh, fortunate enough to have somebody uh, sit, th who's agreed to sit down with me uh, for four interviews, and this is Andre Polgar. He's just written a new book called *The Age of Anomaly*, which I read, uh, you know, over the past week or so, and it is a really, a really well put together book. It appealed to me on a number of levels. Uh, the first is that it, his voice. Uh, it, there's a, a huge amount of humility in his voice. It's not one of these books where you read and it's somebody that is just like this voice on high that's like telling you the way it is and is just dumping a bunch of stuff on you. Uh, he has a great sense of like, you know, there, there are no crystal balls out there. You know, we, we can't be sure about these things, but here is, you know, the results of my research. Here is, you know, some of my expertise that I'm presenting to you. Really accessible, really well written. And he's, again, he's decided to sit down and uh, share some of his knowledge with us about his new book. So Andre, thank you very much for uh, being with us. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Well, I, I really appreciate you being here because this is something that I have a lot of trouble with myself. And uh, you've agreed to do four videos with us. Thank you very much. And in the first one, I think you and I discussed that we were going to uh, talk about the idea of, you know, how did we get here? You know, why are we in this situation where everyone feels this kind of sense that there's something wrong, something's about to break, we're all walking on thin ice. I, I'm trying to think of some more metaphors and cliches I can throw in there, but I, I think that, that'll suffice at the moment. So um, maybe you can explain to us, how did we get to this state? Well, first and foremost, uh, I released my book to my email subscribers who are kind of like the biggest fans of the channel, and they were surprised as to why exactly I am putting my professional life on hold to spread the word about my new book, to, to focus so much on this message and the thing is i've made a name for myself kind of on one minute economics as this guy who is good at making complicated stuff simple to understand and i cover very broad topics on my channel i cover anything from statistics related stuff to economic history whatever and i have never before in my career had a deeper sense of urgency than i am having right now with this book and the thing is, everything that has to do with my career, everything that has to do with my life experience makes it clear to me that we are in for something generationally unprecedented. And of course, I, I, I keep in touch with people from all over the world and I frequently get this. Perhaps most of them cannot exactly pinpoint one specific thing about what, that they are worried about, but they know something is up. They know something just feels deeply unnatural about the financial system. And I've kind of made it my life's mission for the time being to dig deeper into that and, and to use my expertise and to use, you know, basically give it 110% in order, in order to see these things under the microscope. And to do so, in my book, I've done extensive research on anything from the very first documented asset bubble, which is the tulip mania that peaked around uh, late 1636 to early 1637. So a long time ago, I've taken things from there to, of course, more recent anomaly case studies like the dot-com bubble, like the Great Recession, to give you two example of popular, examples of popular ones, or of course even exotic situations that nobody aside from myself and a few other people knew about, like the short domain mania of late 2015 to early 2016. And to address the question of why exactly I'm doing that, I want to make it clear that people should not be studying economic history because 
we know for a fact that it's gonna repeat itself and by studying it, we're going to be able to pinpoint an exact date and time. We're gonna be able to know exactly what's gonna happen and when it's gonna happen. As I make clear in my book, we study history because it gives us a meaningful glimpse into who we are. It doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And by taking things one case study, study at a time, by finding common denominators, by basically trying to see what makes us tick from an economic perspective, why we sometimes get overly euphoric, why we sometimes let things degenerate into anomaly without doing anything about it, and finally, why and how we panic. And by identifying these common denominators, I feel I'm helping people kind of understand how, what exactly it is that's going on, that's problematic at this point. And what I mean by this, what worries me at this point is not just one thing. It worries me that I see these pockets of anomaly all over the world and it's their combined effect. It's not just one particular bubble that I'm seeing and I'm like, oh yeah, something similar has happened in the past and this is what I'm worried and this is what I think is gonna happen next. No, instead I treat each pocket of anomaly like a symptom rather than the actual disease because the elephant in the room, the thing that worries me now is not that we will end up dealing with just your average business cycle, you know, exogenous shock, stock market crash or whatever, but instead that we are in for something generationally, generation defining even. And unfortunately, as you're gonna be able to find out in my book, throughout history, the average person tends to be on the losing end of it. And uh, in this interview, I would like to discuss in a bit more detail how exactly we got here. You mentioned the idea of anomalies. Uh, what do you mean when you say uh, an economic anomaly? An economic anomaly, in my view, and I'm gonna go right ahead and move on to what happened and what got me worried. An economic anomaly in our context is something that's downright outrageous, but that we have gotten to accept as the status quo. Just to give you some quick historic context, we had the dot-com bubble, as we all know, that burst, people were panicking, there was massive fear in the market, and, and you know, the powers that be obviously were afraid of repercussions because right off the bat, if you're the head of a government or a central bank, there's one thing you don't want. You do not want to be that guy. You do not want to be the person under whom it all came crashing down. So words cannot begin to describe just how big of an incentive there is for people to keep the ball rolling, kick the can down the road, and if possible, just make sure it doesn't collapse on their watch. And in my view, it's exactly what happened. Because you see, the narrative has been this. We had this huge crash, but don't worry, central banks and governments have saved the day. They've lowered, it. the central bank has lowered interest rates from 6.5% all the way down to 1%, which again, in light of what I've said previously, 1%, there, there doesn't seem to be anything special about it because we're so used to artificially low interest rates. But for that context, it was a huge, huge thing to lower them that much. And they did, and the narrative remained that they saved the day. Even if we stick to that narrative, fair enough, they saved the day, but it came at a price, and that price was inflating an even bigger bubble the real estate bubble. Once again, that collapsed in 2007 to 2008. But the narrative they tried and succeeded to a certain extent in pushing the same narrative. In other words, yes, there's panic in the air, but don't worry, just like last time, central banks and governments have it under control. Unfortunately, much like a drug addict, the market demanded a bigger dose of stimulus. And not only had in the United States, for example, not only the interest rates have to be lowered all the way to zero, but they directly pumped money into the system. And here is where the anomaly dimension kicks in. In the United States, they did so to the tune of 85 billion per year. 
40 billion in mortgage-backed securities and 45 in treasuries. In the U European Union, if we were to transform it in dollars, they pumped even more money into the system at their height of QE, uh, uh, of quantitative easing per year. But let's switch back to the United States. 85 billion per month. Multiply that by 12 and we have roughly a trillion per year. Let us just say that from 1913, when the Federal Reserve appeared, all the way until the Great Recession of 2007 to 2008, so in almost 100 years, roughly 850-ish billion dollars had accumulated in the monetary base. So what I'm trying to say is that effectively these people pumped more money into the system in one year at the height of QE than had accumulated in approximately 100 years in the United States. And nowadays, this is just status quo information. This is something we take for granted because, again, the narrative has been that, yeah, stuff went wrong, but central banks have it under control. And it's this level of anomaly that I see in the system that worries me because this level of anomaly has obviously given birth to all sorts of micro you know, ecosystems and their combined effect is just impossible to, to calculate. There are so many pockets of anomaly all over the world that it's even, you know, it, it's next to impossible to try to predict just what the ramifications are going to be the ramifications of all of this. Let's talk, we can talk about the derivatives market. We can talk about the not even trillion, but quadrillions of dollars that are potentially on the hook. We can talk about the various misallocations of capital, about companies that use their access to cheap money to basically buy back their stocks, about the fact that everywhere in the world, we switched to this unsustainable monster of a system that needs perpetual growth to sustain itself. And unfortunately, as has happened multiple times throughout history, when we get this carried away and when we get this eager to accept the abnormal as a status quo, things are going to get bad. And at the risk of repeating myself, the average person usually finds himself on the wrong end of this dramatic transfer of wealth that is going to occur as a result of the big reset I envision. Why do you feel as though people uh, allow things to get to this point, like, to get to the core of, you know, how, you know why we are here? Why, why, why are people allowing things to go here? I know in your book you, you mentioned the analogy of the, of the frog in the boiling water, and you actually, I think it's clever the way you kind of debunk it, that actually people have tested that and the frogs do jump out of the water. But, um, uh, but people don't seem to. Why, why do you feel that between politicians yeah. and the average people that kind of support them through their, you know, in action or, or, or otherwise, why do you feel that this is what, why are people pushing things in this direction? What, what is incentivizing that? What is pushing things here? The thing is that from start to finish, the entire chain is deeply morally corrupted. And what I mean by this is that at the very top of the chain, of course, we have policymakers who have all of the incentive in the world to want to preserve the status quo for political reasons. The political backlash associated with something like the system coming crashing down on your watch would be just unfathomable for someone who is a career politician. So these people essentially will stop at nothing to ensure that when it breaks, they won't be here to have to deal with it. And for this reason, it should not surprise us the least bit that central bankers, that governments are willing to embark on unsustainable policy journeys because at the end of the day, they care more about saving themselves than they do about the sustainability of the system. But let's not lose sight of the fact that the average person has a role in this as well. We can, of course, make this mental exercise of painting us ultimately as victims. But I would venture to say a case could be made that maybe we're not victims. Maybe many of us are accomplices because we can talk about, for example, the Great Recession and the, the, the gross misallocations of capital that occurred back then. A lot of people willingly have used their homes as personal ATM machines. 
They lived beyond their means, they kept up with the Joneses, they surpassed the Joneses only for the jo Joneses to play catch up eventually. And this all spiraled into what people back then called reality. Once again, a case could be made that a lot of individuals have not been victim, have been victims, yes, but also accomplices. Then there's the fact that at the business level, things are deeply corrupt as well. Let's remember the entire situation with moral hazard during the previous recession. Because yeah, of course, people are at fault for taking out loans in the United States, for example, and in many other places as well that they knew they would have trouble keeping up with. But what about the other end of that deal? What about the people, the bankers, who gave them those loans in the first place? Once again, it's a deeply corrupted incentive system where basically you had people in the banking sector who had all of the reasons in the world to give out unsustainable loans because they didn't care. They got their bonus regardless, so they made it their life's mission to just cash in on these bonuses as much as possible. And once again, what happens next? is not going to be their concern, or at least they're too busy counting their money right now to worry about what happens next. So the entire bonus structure, when it comes to the banking system, was so deeply flawed that essentially people were rewarded for propagating the unsustainable. Then ultimately we have just the final piece of the puzzle, which is the financial system. Because the financial system said, you know what? Why don't we take people, people's mortgages, package them together into complex financial instruments and sell them on Wall Street? So this itself gave banks even more of an incentive not to care because, hey, put yourself in the position of a banker. You gave a bunch of people unsustainable loans. Knowing that you do so to get a huge bonus, you get your bonus and not only do you get all that money, but your bank is not on the hook because as soon as the banking question seals the deal, it's no longer the traditional banking relationship where you know the bank knew that if it gives you a loan, then it's going to have a long-term relationship with you and it's, it has every reason in the world to wanna make sure you're a trustworthy person, that narrative changed as well. And all of a sudden, the bank no longer cared. It got you to sign on the dotted line, it did its part, and then it packaged your loan and sold it off on Wall Street, thereby washing its hands when it comes to everything that comes next. And it is this genuinely insane, vicious circle of corruption that ultimately gave birth to the very context we find ourselves in today. So it sounds like it's almost, it's a culmination of a million different pinpoints of self-interest acting. Uh, you know, whereas, you know, the system of capitalism is generally, I mean, its strength is that everyone acts in their own self-interest and that kind of creates a collective, you know, positive benefit. But in the way you're describing it, in the, at least in the way that it's operating at the moment, instead of all these collective self-interests moving towards something positive, it's in this, you know, backwards feedback loop where it's creating this growing and, uh, you know, worsening uh, future for all of us that is being kicked down the road because nobody wants to personally be the one to, you know, for it to uh, manifest on their watch. And that's what we wanted to talk about in the next video, actually. Andre is going to chat with us about the idea of what keeps him up at night, what is his big fear about, uh, you know, what he sees coming down the road. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the signals that he's watching for to know, you know, when the shit's about to hit the fan. So that's it. We'll talk about that on the next episode. Thank you very much, Andre, for being with us, and we'll see you next time. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.